to it. Um, so I'm going to be speaking to you today about um, the spirit of Antichrist. And I'm going to go ahead and add another phrase in here. In the same spirit of Antichrist, the anti-church. Now, this is a piggyback off of the complacent church. I've been laying that foundations since last Sunday. We laid it again some more Thursday. And I would encourage you to go back and look at that because this is building on something. And if I was to go back and repeat all of those things, just to make sure that we're all on the same page, I would be doing us a disservice to go further in this revelation. So I would encourage you uh, to go back and look at what was said last Sunday and last Thursday. Those links are on the watch, um, the watch live link, not the videos, the watch live link. You can go and get those more recent. The videos have the edited videos. They all pretty up and clean. The watch live is unedited and available instantly. So you can go get like this service instantly later today if you were to go there. So I'm going to be talking about the Antichrist and the, and, and the anti-church. And again, this goes with the complacent church. Now, we define complacency, um, and it is defined as showing smug or an uncritical satisfaction with one's own achievements. Again, it's smug or uncritical satisfaction. In other words, I'm not criticizing myself. I'm uncritical. And it goes along with what Jesus was revealing to the church of Laodicea in Revelations chapter 3, starting at verse 14, where that church had the nerve to say to the Lord, I am increased with goods and have no need of nothing. And the Lord looked at them and said, no, you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. So their garments were not clean because he offered them white garments. And whereas in they thought they were rich, he was like, no, you are extremely poor. That's like a person thinking I'm up here in the spirit. When God come and say, no, you, you really at base level. You're not nowhere in the spirit. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And, and, and the Lord has to come with a spirit of prophecy and revelation to reveal that to a person. And, 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 and some re, some of, one of the reasons a person can get like that is because for whatever reason, we allowed some cold in with the hot and the Lord distances himself. And, and in, in our own self-conceit, we begin to think that we all that. But once the Lord comes back in, and that's what the invitation was to the church of Laodicea, let me back in the door because I want to give you some, some, some gold tried in the fire. I want to give you some true riches. And basically what that means is if you want the glory of God, the only way you're going to get that is to come into a place of knowing the fear of the Lord. Because the scripture basically says this concerning the fear of the Lord, it is to depart from evil. It also says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And in another place, it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so until I get to a place when I'm re willing to remove the foolishness out of my life, if I can remove the foolishness out of thy life, the Lord will begin to feed me with knowledge. He will begin to feed me with wisdom. And another place says it like this. The secret of the Lord is with those that fear him. In other words, when I start respecting him and living right, he will take me to a higher place. But the complacent church think they all that with some hot there and, a, and some cold there. 
And they're presenting to God a mixture. And he said, before I let you present a mixture to me, I'll spew you out of my mouth. If you think you're going to hold on to that little bit of evil in your life, that situational sin, that pattern, seasonal disobedience, or that habitual, willful sin that you live in every single day. If you think you're going to have that and say my name and know me, you are mistaken. You're mistaken. So I wanted to give you some complacency. Now, Jesus introduced himself to this church as the amen. And this word can be used in different context. It's interpreted um, differently. Um, sometimes it's interpreted the word amen. And it is also interpreted, and I'm just pulling it up so that I can get ready to teach you. Amen. Hold a second. Let me pull it up. I'm going to flow in a second. Lord, I give you the glory. Yeah. Yeah. It's also, and I want to give you the numbers too, this Greek word is interpreted verily 101 times. The same Greek word is, is interpreted amen 51 times. So sometimes the translators would make a decision that this particular Greek word, if it's basically at the beginning of a statement, it'll be verily. But if it's at the end of a statement, this same Greek word, we will interpret it as amen. And basically when it's at the end of a statement, what a person is doing when they hear it is saying, so be it. So be it. Now, again, the Greek word alone means properly to be firmed or something that's trustworthy. That's what Dr. Hunter mentioned on Thursday to you when she touched this Greek, the, the Greek word of this word, amen. But again, depending on its placement, will make a determination on what it means. And so most of the time when a person says a statement or a prayer is recited to God, you say, amen. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It is, it is a declaration when a prophetic word or something is being spoke to you where you say, amen, or so be it. When Jesus introduces himself to this church as the faithful, the true witness, the amen, the beginning of the creation of God. What he is basically saying is the so be it is getting ready to say something to you. That basically means that I'm about to tell you something and I don't need you to reject what I'm about to say. Because I'm about to come to some people who say, I'm rich and increased of goods and have need of nothing. And when I get through talking to you, I don't need you to reject what I'm saying. I need you to say, so be it. Amen. You hear what I'm saying? So be it. Because if I don't say so be it, I'll never deal with that situational sin. I will make excuses for myself and say things, well, I was angry and that's why I did it. When the scripture says, don't be, ang be angry and sin not. Or you'll say, you'll, you'll just come up with reasons like she said, oh, I wasn't prayed up that day. The Lord said, deal with the cold. Stop presenting to me a mixture and giving me excuses as to why you feel like you need to remain in that pattern of disobedience. Let me give you an example of this. I know I called it the Antichrist, the Antichurch, and I can get into that in a moment. But I want to give you an example of this. My goodness. 1 Timothy 2, verse 12. 1 Timothy 2 and 12. What we're talking about, uh, that situational sin. Now, let me just give you a little premise on the title and why it is what it is. While you go to 1 Timothy. What, what the Lord is trying to say with this title, the, the Antichrist and the Antichurch. Uh, the scripture warns us that the Antichrist is coming. But John went a little further to say the spirit is already here. The spirit is already here. Antichrist denies that Jesus is the Christ. The, the Antichrist spirit that lives in the anti-church, and I'll give you another way that they say it in the scriptures. 
And this is actually a biblical statement. It calls it the synagogue of Satan. The synagogue of Satan. In other words, it's a gathering of people that's supposed to be of God, but is really of Satan. The anti-church, just like the anti-Christ rejects Jesus himself, the anti-church rejects the word. There is a church, synagogues of Satan, that reject the word, just like antichrist reject the deity and the personhood of who Jesus is. And the spirit of antichrist is already in operation. So the spirit of antichrist, one of the things that it, it is rejecting is it's rejecting that revelation that Jesus is the word of God. And therefore, it rejects him when it causes a church or gathering or that synagogue of Satan model to resist truth. Now, if we were to make it plain to us today, the question is, am I a part of that church? And the only way you're going to know if you're a part of that church is how you handle truth. What do you do when they tell you you got a spirit of lust? What do you do when they tell you you wrestle with anger? What do they do? What do you do when they say you rebellious and you don't respect authority? How you handle it? How do you handle that truth? Am I the anti-church? Am I in the synagogue of Satan? And, and as the Antichrist will resist the person of Jesus, the office of Jesus, am I a part of a church that resists Jesus, but it's in another form? It's Jesus the Word. Do I resist him? Am I a part of that anti-church? Let me give you this verse here in 1 Timothy, chapter 2, verse 9. Well, let's start at um, verse 12. Now, one of the, uh, you, have, if you, you have to understand something about me. God has um, called me, and he called me to do a couple things. And it's been revealed to me that one of the things that I actually have an anointing to do is to counsel uh, married couples. I have an anointing for that. Just like I have an anointing for um, end time Bible prophecy teaching. God came to me and said, prepare my people for the evil days to come. When he said that, it came with revelation on end time prophecy. Amen. All throughout the scriptures, whether it's law, prophets, Jesus, the apostles, it all lines up perfectly as one message, and it is from the Lord. One of the things he, he called uh, me to do is, is, is marry couples. And so I, I have the ability through the spirit of God to speak to relationships. Now, it's no great thing because all I really do is just get into the scriptures and say, this is what God's word say. Amen. Amen. This is my presentation to you. This is not my opinion. This is what God, God's word say. Well, this is something that God's word say. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, starting at verse 12, says this, I suffer not a woman to teach mm -hmm, or to usurp authority over the man. Now, that usurping is to take that authority by force. You hear what I'm saying? I am going to take this by force. And some of the ways that a woman may take it by force while they teach the man is through manipulations such as crying, anger, tears, distance, uh, withholding in the bedroom. And that's a powerful manipulation to take authority. I'm going to rule this thing. I'm going to rule this thing and I'm gonna use what you like in that bedroom to get you to obey me. Mm -hmm. That's usurping authority. 
And sometimes women will use that and, and, and they'll usurp that authority and then go even further to say, I'm going to teach you. This is how this is going to work. If you function like this, you are not ready for marriage. There is a perverseness in you as a woman if you think like this or you function and operate like this. And that thing needs to be completely purged out of you or you will go into a marriage, turn it upside down, and it will be satanic. Now, again, this is one of the things that women don't like to deal with. And, you, and one of the things, you would, you would think that some women don't know this verse by how much they talk. How many of you know if you've ever been in a relationship or a marriage, a woman can be extremely mouthy. She can be mouthy. I mean, she about to run over you with that mouth. You're going to obey and submit, and I'm going to use my mouth to do it. While I also use my cold shoulder and my withholding, I will usurp authority. You will obey me. That's a spirit that is perverse against the order of God. Mm -hmm. But we got a lot of that going on. Amen. Amen. A woman will beat you into submission just the way I said she would. Mm -hmm. Withhold from you that mouth, that cold shoulder, that distance. You will obey me. Mm -hmm. But it's perverse and backwards. And so the scripture says, let... <laughs> Let me finish reading it. <laughs> Hold a second. Verse 11 says, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. Mm -hmm. Be quiet. And be under obedience. Amen. Be quiet and be under obedience. All right. That's a lesson for a lot of women right there. That's a big thing. That's a huge thing. Come on now, I didn't been there, I didn't seen the sessions. I didn't, I didn't counsel the married couples. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It's the shouting at the top of the lungs. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And a lot of that comes straight out of the woman as she's saying what she got to feel like she got to say. Mm -hmm. But I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority. Now, I'm going to tell you something again. As that is written in the scriptures, it happens. And it's a strong thing that happens. It says, but to be in silence. For Adam was formed first. He's going on to talk about the order. And then Eve, the woman, uh, Adam was not deceived, but the woman was uh, deceived and in transgression. Of course, she gave Adam what the devil taught her. Amen. Here's the fruit. The devil taught me that I should eat it, and I'm telling you to eat it. She was deceived, and she passed that along to him. Now, we jump over to Peter. I just wanted to lay that foundation in. in, in. So what was the foundation that you were supposed to get? I, I, I suffer not a woman to teach. And that's what's going on in a lot of these marriages. You get into a marriage, and, and, and what you don't realize is you are getting into an institution, if you're a woman, where God has called you to be in subjection. So you really have to watch 
who it is you're going to yoke yourself up with. Sometimes in the dating phase, you'll begin to see some patterns. You'll begin to see some situational demons in a man. Well, when he gets angry, he may disrespect you. Or if you see him angry, he, he'll, he'll speak all kind of manner of wickedness, even against his own mama. You really in trouble if you hook up and yoke yourself up with that person. Sometimes women, because of loneliness, will date a man that's not even in church, but will make excuses because you are lonely. And again, sometimes that loneliness, that low self-worth will allow you to drop those standards and bring a heathen into the door. And he will manifest his sin in your presence, including trying to tempt you to sin, and you keep him there because of that low self-worth and that low self-esteem. Let me give you a secret. There is a, and this is a term in the scripture, a beauty that goes along with holiness. What am I telling you? If you choose to do it God's way, God will rub something on you where there is a beauty on you. A beauty on you in your modesty how you dress, a beauty on you in your silence, a beauty on you in how you carry yourself. It is extremely powerful. And God will even go as far to say, if you learn how to live like this, I will make him honor you or I won't even hear his prayers. I will make him honor you. That means he's not going to just totally disregard you because that's the reason why women feel like they got to take power because they feel like they are being taken advantage of. But what God is telling you is, I need you to pull back and shut your mouth. I don't need you to try to teach him. I just need you to still reverence him and show him respect in his ignorance and in his foolishness. And while you are in that place, I will begin to deal with him. But as long as you keep fighting, I have to circle this test around to you again, like what Minister Harris was just talking about, until you learn how to overcome and shut your mouth. Stop trying to teach him and stop trying to usurp authority and stop using your bag of tricks to bring him under your control. Put your bag of tricks up today. This might be one of the things I need to burn. This may be one of the things I need to get rid of. Get your bag of tricks and begin to trust in God. And let the house be in order. Mm -hmm. We're just dealing with some cold that may be still existing. This is the coal we don't acknowledge. You hear what I'm saying? Oh, no, I don't smoke crack. Oh, no, no, no. I don't drink Coke 45s. And, and no, I don't, I don't drink alcohol. I don't need no whiskey and no scotch. No, 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 no. I ain't in no homosexuality. But you manipulate your husband behind closed doors. You do not respect and reverence him. In fact, you usurp authority and try to teach him. That's your coal. That is your code. While we sit there and look pious like we ain't got nothing wrong with us. Mm -hmm. All right, let's look at Peter now. Likewise, wives, 1 Peter 3. Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. Your own husband, not somebody else's husband. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you'll go get boo on the side, side piece, and you, you'll listen to him over your own husband. Be in subjection to your own husband. That one you stood up there in front of that pastor and said, I'm, 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 I'm forsaking all others for you. Mm -hmm. Till death do us part. Amen. I'm some heavy words. That's why you don't want to marry no foolishness. You want to make sure you're dealing with somebody that's stable in the faith, that's submitted to God, that knows that leadership is service. Because Jesus said, the greatest among you 
is those that serve, and I am among you as he that serve. Let me teach you some leadership. Can you wash somebody's feet? This is for my men. Leadership is not barking orders. It's empathy. It's sympathizing. It's service. And it's being the chief example with the word of God on your lips. Scripture has to warn men, don't be bitter against your wives. But the scripture also teaches us, well, why are you carrying all of that doggone bitterness? Remember that love covers a multitude of sins. Where's your love at while you're angry? Where's your love at while you're looking at it and you're disrespectful and you're disgusted? Where is your love? Why have you not covered her transgressions? Because he taught us to love us. That's a command from him. I command you to love. I like that verse. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, and he gave himself for it. Scripture says when we were without strength, Christ died for the ungodly. In other words, love is when you're at your greatest weakness. I'm going to minister to you, love you, look over your faults, build you up and try to set you in a good place. The scripture would say later on in that same text about loving your wife as Christ, that I need to nourish and cherish you. I need to love you like you're my own body because you are my body. You're not going to stab yourself unless you got a demon in you. You cherish your body. You feed it. You take care of it. You massage it. You mend it up if you break your skin and hurt yourself. Love your wife like that. And sometimes the pain in the wound is emotional. It's not always physical. Mm -hmm. So when you see disappointment, when you see tears flowing and running, it's time for you to heal the sick. It's time for you to love. And sometimes that love is manifested in service. It's manifested in respect and honor. Sometimes your spouse may tell you, I need some space. Honor them and give them the space. And then circle back and deal with those issues in a respectful, honorable manner with a meek tone <laughs> as if you are talking with another air of grace. Talk to them like you're talking to a, a politician that has a lot of power in a very respectful tone, but at least make your points and make them clear. Because she's an air of grace just like you are. She's invited to be seated with Jesus in heavenly places just like you are. Jesus died for her just like he died for you. That means she is important to him just like you are. So even though she's subject and has have to obey you in many regards, you still have to show her some serious respect. And one of the ways you can show that respect is to be considerate of what it is she wants. Because the scripture also says that the husband should work to please the wife. That means you're not going to be selfish because you're the head and everything got to be your way. You have to also be very considerate of hers and also give her the things that she wants because you are called to please her. So while you have the last say, don't be selfish with it. Mm -hmm. Don't be selfish with it. Look for opportunities to give up unto half of my kingdom, as the scripture would say. What do you want? I'll give you whatever you want, up to half my kingdom. That's what you should be saying. 
what, should, what do you want? We need to go uh, to Jamaica. Okay, well, let's think about it and talk about that. Let me see how I can, uh, we can put this together. How we can set some funds to the side and make this happen for you because you want it. Lord, I give you the glory. Don't be so selfish. Mm -hmm. Leadership is service. You should be a greater servant. That's what leadership is. It's not you sitting on some thrones barking out orders. It's service. And yes, you do have the last say. The decision is ultimately yours. You will have the rule in the house, but also honor her. Be very considerate. Seek to please her. And these are in the, this in the scripture. That you as a husband should seek to please your wife. Lord, I give you the glory. Mm -hmm. Not showing honor. Not working to please. Amen. Come on. Don't let the king of Persia outdo you. Don't let the king of Persia outdo you, men. And see what he had to say to his wife. Then said the king unto her, what do you want? What do you will? Mm -hmm. Queen Esther, what is it your request? Are you seeing here that he's, he's being unselfish? In fact, he's generous. Look at what he goes on to say. It shall be given unto thee to the half of the kingdom. Now, this is a man who is a world ruler. His wife come in the door. I want to know what you want. And I want you to know in advance I'm willing to grant your request. And I will do so generously. Don't let the king of Persia outdo you. So this is where men have to learn how to honor and seek to please their wives and serve their wives. Jesus says, I'm among you as he that serve. If he is willing to wash some feet, you ought to be willing to massage some feet. You ought to be willing to massage some shoulders. You hear what I'm saying? This is where you, you make her feel comfortable. You help her to relax. You hear what I'm saying? This is where she may not fix your plate, you may fix hers. Because I'm a, I'm, 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 if I'm supposed to be the head here in the example, and like Christ, I need to be the better servant. Let me fix your plate. You didn't went in there and slaved and cooked it. Let me fix your plate. And after that, I'll go on and wash the dishes. I appreciate you cooking for me. And for the kids. Where's the service at? Where's the, the servant's robe like Jesus? Where is, let me fix your plate for you and then let me give you a massage right afterwards. Or get the bath started for you. Mm -hmm. And if you got the jacuzzi cut tub, we'll cut the jets on for you too. We'll cut the jets on for you. Put some bubbles in there. Put a little candle in there because I know you like candlelight and we'll cut the lights off with the, with the jets on, the bubbles and the candle and just give you a moment of silence at the end of your hard day. I am among you, Jesus said, as he that served. And I also encourage wives to have that same spirit. Let Jesus manifest in you, you serve him. Let Jesus, you man, let Jesus manifest in you and you serve her. We understand again you have the last say, but I also ought to be willing to hear what she wants and be willing to give generously to her concern if I can do it, and if it's not sin. Amen. Don't let the king of Persia outdo you. Last place, Peter, amen. Just in turn into marriages instead of 
But you know what? We still dealing with that. We still dealing with that antichrist spirit. You hear what I'm saying? That's, that's some of these things that persist in marriages is that cause divisions. Mm -hmm. You know that spirit of low self-esteem can even happen in a marriage. Husband ain't treating you right and giving you the attention you want. And guess what? I'm going to get it from somewhere else. So you get dolled up and get attention from everybody else that's around you. He may not be looking, but I got these five brothers looking. Mm -hmm. But that ain't no good spirit to have. That ain't no good spirit to have. Because you're entertaining a spirit of whoredoms. You're entertaining the spirit of, I have options. If you don't act right, I'll go to my other options. And I want you to know I have those options. Come on now. I had to check myself with that recently. Where when I'm dealing with my wife and we don't agree, I'll say something like, well, go on, I don't need you. I mean, I don't have any self-esteem problems. <laughs> I don't at all. I don't need you. Go. Do what you do what you want to do. God rebuked me for thinking like that. Why? Because you can't put her away except for fornication. She ain't doing that. You're just arguing over something. And then two, your Bible says don't put a don't put asunder what God has joined together. That is hoardish, whorish thinking. Because while you're talking about I have options, you're considering somebody else. That's whorish. And it is not cleaving to the one that God gave you. Mm -hmm. I take that slap, Lord. You right. You is right. I should not think like that. When that thought comes across just because I'm disappointed at her, I should not think I have options. That is a whorish way of thinking. What options do you have when she ain't cheating on you? None. You just got to sit there and deal with the mess. Deal with the mess. Mm -hmm. My goodness, let me head to the runway. Land the ship. Okay, First Peter 3, and I'm going to have to, I'm not going to teach this as I would. We need to be taking communion and going home. First Peter 3. I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over a man is what we talked about. This will be the last point we make, and, and this is what I'll say. I'll just go ahead and say it. Sometimes, again, women feel like it's time to teach and to usurp authority and uh, not show reverence because he is a heathen. He is disobedient to the word. He's not doing what he's supposed to be doing. Come on, can I get a witness? How many women have been across and looked at some man and was like, man, you off completely. You are not lining up with God. You hearing what I'm saying? You are way off from God. And while you're standing here talking about you, my head. All right. Uh -huh. that, that's a real thing. All right. You ain't got to believe me. What I'm saying is very real. Mm -hmm. So what does a woman do when she is faced and have to deal with a man who is off? Now, first of all, you don't go look joined to that. You don't go, well, I know he smoked crack, but love covers the multitude of sin. Marry us, pastor. Marry us, pastor. Because you lonely. You lonely and you want to marry somebody. So you go marry him. Yeah, I know he smoked crack. Yeah, the, 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 he got the pipe in the car, but, but love covers the multitude of sins. I won't even see it. Yeah, okay. Last point. Likewise, wives, be in subjection to your own husband. Verse 1 of 1 Peter 3. If any obey not the word, that without the word he may be, whole, he may be won by the conversation and holy living of the wives, while he beholds your holy living coupled with reverence. 
fear. The question is, can I reverence you while you're in your foolishness? See, this is where women teach. <laughs> this is where women usurp authority. I'm going to teach you out of this foolishness you're in. I'm not going to obey you. Therefore, you are usurping authority. I'm not listening to you because you are an ungodly man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is how the Bible says you should deal with that ungodly man. Now, don't you go marry that ungodly man. We do. We hoping we dealing with something that, well, you know, he was right at first. But then once we got into thing, he began to lose his mind. Okay. All right. He began to lose his mind afterwards. This is the part where women struggle to show respect. This is the part where they feel like I need to usurp authority. This is the part where I feel like I need to teach you. And how do you teach them? With arguments. You teach them with arguments. Mm -hmm. I'm going to argue you into obedience. I'm going to argue you into obedience. Mm-hmm. Usurping authority, and you're going to do it with your mouth. And then you'll manipulate him in the bedroom and with the cold shoulder and all of those other things until you get your way. Mm -hmm. There it is showing up again. Look at what he says. But the scripture says you should win him without the word. That he's supposed to behold your holy living, and you're going to still show him reverence while he's in his foolishness. Do you know how much strength that takes? To live with foolishness and not say nothing? It almost sounds stupid. I mean, you know, the, to, to the fleshly mind, that's, that's crazy. You don't want me to say nothing? That's crazy. But that's the word of God. We got to deal with the, our opinion about the word of God. I got to deal with how I feel about that. This is something that women struggle with. If he ain't lining up, I'm going to give him my words and I ain't going to submit to that dog. Mm -hmm. Women struggle with this. God says live a holy life before him and be quiet because I want you to win him without the word. Let him watch your holy living, and then I want you to keep showing him respect. Show, you want me to show respect to his drunk, unemployed self while I'm carrying the load of this whole house, and you want me to come home after I didn't work and show him reverence and respect as if he is handling business? That's what God wants. God don't want that situation to get you out of character. And we allow that situation. That what we was talking about, King, was talking about emotional demons, situational demons. If his life ain't lining up, I won't line up. But God said, I want your life to line up even when his life don't line up. All right. He need to be one without the word. Mm -hmm. Then they tell you, go on and put on, or well, verse three, whose adorning is not the outward adorning, planting of hair, wearing of gold, putting on apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart. This is how you should dress, young lady, which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is of the sight of God of great price. And it goes on to say, for after this, the old, in the old time, holy women, are you holy, who trusted in God? How I many you know you got to trust in God? I'm not saying nothing to you, and I'm still showing you respect. I have to trust in God to do that. And it went even further as to say how uh, even as Sarah obeyed, calling Abraham Lord. Mm -hmm. Can you still show that respect when he in foolishness? 
Can you still be quiet? Can you still reverence? Mm -hmm. That's enough. Come on. Amen. The so be it. So be it. Come on. Come on. The Lord has been dealing with the complacent church. He's been telling us, look, y'all still got some cold in there that I need to deal with. You think you're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. No, it's some cold there. It's some straight up cold in there. And I need to get it out. And it's things that you wouldn't even think about or acknowledge that's sin and transgression. It is there. And it needs to be repented of. Come on. All right, let's go ahead and pray. Let's re repeat this prayer. Father God, I come to you and I acknowledge my sin but today i receive jesus christ as my lord and my savior come into my life change me fill me with the holy spirit i accept your salvation and i accept that all of my sins have been put on jesus and now i stand in your perfect righteousness in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for tuning in to the television broadcast of Bethel Christian Church with Pastors Donald and Dana Hunter. We hope this broadcast was a blessing to you and invite you to join us for the live worship experience at 1906 Beaumont Drive, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, 70806 at 10 a.m. for Sunday services or online at www.bethelbr.net.